and you know uh, it was really nice that you chose a topic like this because uh, people really don't say it you said it minimally invasive proctology in IAGS absolutely right and it uh, it was not a topic which is ready made so it made me think I had a big board on my dining table and I was jotting down my thoughts and I'll show you what I thought why should we do minimally invasive surgery in proctology now the people in the audience no matter what surgery they do whichever field they are in if they are surgeons they will have lots of patients of proctology problems so minimal invasive surgery in proctology was the need well routinely the gold standard for hemorrhoid surgery is hemorrhoidectomy but we know that we are taking away the cushions and it also deals with below the dentate line and when we do minimal invasive surgery almost all the procedures are cushion anal cushions are preserved so what the how does it help it maintains fecal sampling decreases bleeding and the pain is less not painless the pain is less the procedures available are rubber band ligation sclerotherapy irc laser hemorrhoidoplasty doppler guided hemorrhoidal artery ligation miph and suturopexy so how to do uh, mis in pathology we must first learn the correct procedure when to do when not to do and to wisely use the instrument or energy device now what is happening is uh, people are jumping on the bandwagon and everybody wants to go in for either MIPH or the patients uh, are demanding that you do laser on me so or uh, waft on me but you got to know is this patient actually requiring it so as Dr. Uh, Roy always puts it a fool with a tool is always a fool so before you jump on to hemorrhoids you have to understand what are we dealing with are we dealing which grade of hemorrhoid are we dealing with and what problem is the patient having now acrsi has further classified hemorrhoids into single pile mass this one single pile mass two piles which is but less than 50 percent circumference circumferential hemorrhoids and thrombosed hemorrhoids now why do we not need to know this we need to know this because if it's a single pile mass you know you can do this 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 if it's a circumferential pile mass well you have to think do we can we do a hemorrhoidectomy can we do something else which will give more relief to the patient so as we see this how the hemorrhoids are this is single pile two piles more than two circumferential and protruding so all this data is transferred onto this sheet which is available in february issue of indian journal of surgery 2017 and this basically shows you what surgeries are there now the disappointing fact is that all people want to go and do great for uh, are treating all hemorrhoids like they want to operate on all hemorrhoids but that is not true for grade one and two you don't need to do surgery unless your non-surgical procedures have failed and sadly in india we are not doing minimal invasive uh, surgery that is non-surgical procedures for hemorrhoids of grade one and two even for grade 2 and grade 1, we are telling them going for staplers, going for laser, going for uh, hemorrhoidectomy, which is not required. Now, when you have a patient with hemorrhoid, you have to un understand what are you going to address. Is it bleeding are you addressing? Is it prolapse or is it thrombosis? All three have different elements. Now, if it's bleeding, so you do conservative management, non-operative management, that is... Uh, rubber band ligation and stereotherapy and then if these fail you go for operative but when the element of prolapse is there you th think about surgery and when the element of thrombosis is there you think about operative now using minimally uh, invasive techniques you need to understand if the patient has thrombosis thrombos internal hemorrhoids you don't want to use a stapler in this patient you don't want to do a laser hemorrhoid uh, hemorrhoplasty in these patients you're going to cause more problems it's already thrombos so the treatment would be hemorrhoidectomy so you need to know what you're choosing when you choose a minimally invasive surgery so grade one two and uh, uh, change your lifestyle if this fails then you do these minimal invasive procedures and if that fails then you do operative now operating is divided into two parts one part is uh, what is minimally invasive surgery that is non-cutting you don't really cut the hemorrhoids you don't touch the hemorrhoids in the fact by cutting it so it's uh, hemorrhoidopexy that is suture hemorrhoidopexy what is commonly known as dr chute's procedure doppler guided hemorrhoid artery ligation and laser hemorrhoidoplasty you are not cutting anything 
But when it's grade four or grade three, in some cases you do MIPH for grade three. And when is MIPH and hemorrhoidopexy great in grade three? When it is circumferential. So all around there are hemorrhoids. You don't want to cut anything. You go above the hemorrhoids and you manage them. So what are the minimal invasive uh, techniques available for hemorrhoids? The gold standard we know is hemorrhoidectomy. And you have a hemorrhoid here on the right side. Now this is a normal hemorrhoid area and this is what has come down. What we want to do is we want to restore this. Can we restore this by minimally invasive surgery? Yes. So for grade 1 and 2, rubber band ligation, sclerotherapy. Once you do it, this extra will go in. When you do sclerotherapy, not for this grade 4, but for a grade 1 and 2, all of this will retract and fibros and go up. So it is minimally invasive. For grade 3, stapler hemorrhoidopexy, where you are addressing above the dentate line, you take out a strip, 2 centimeter strip of mucosa, and all of this gets pulled up like a socks. Suturopexy, that is Dr. Chute's technique, when you are stitching here in this line, you are creating artificial ligament of treats. So what you are doing is you are putting everything back inside in the inner canal and then you are hitching it up by two rows of suture and that is going to create a new ligament of treats. I mean, you are doing it with the intransplanter muscles, so therefore that stays up. And when it is circumferential, well, stapler hemodopexy and Chute's technique and grade 4, we should avoid minimal invasive uh, surgeries unless you are well experienced if you're well experienced you know what to do with the thrombosis element and then you go forward now the first one let's come to the easiest one which everybody should be doing but are not doing that is rubber band ligation as we know a grasper is available then you can do a suction one you can buy a multi-band ligator and if you're doing colonoscopy you can do it by colonoscope so what is uh, uh, the, the basic technique is to you go and uh, identify where the hemorrhoids are and once you have done the identification, then you take the ligator and you go above it and you clamp on it. <coughs> so, when you are coming out with this, what you are going to see is the hemorrhoids coming out into the proctoscope and those are the hemorrhoids which have to be addressed. Now, what is new in minimally invasive surgery uh, when you are doing banding? Well, you can band two bands, do two hemorrhoids, not three, two at a time. And when you band them, band them above the dentate line. Once you banded it, you can inject one cc of saline so that will remain dense and the bands are not going to fall off. So this is a suction rubber band a ligator and you introduce it inside after having loaded the bands. Two bands should be at the base of the hemorrhoids in case one slips. And once you put that suction band ligator on the hemorrhoid then you close the hole it will suck it in and you just fire it. it it just takes a few seconds that's it so that's how i did for the other one so the other thing is uh, uh, the second type of minimally invasive surgery is foam sclerotherapy now foam is something which has just come up it's come up in a big way that is uh, polydocanol is used as a foam one cc of polydocanol and four cc of air when you are mixing with a three-way syringe like that it becomes a foam and this foam, you go into the hemorrhoid, you see this yellow, this is the foam and the hemorrhoids become blanched and you've got it covered and with time all of this becomes fibrose. You see the normal cushion there but here the cushion is there but the hemorrhoids are fibrose. So it's a really good way of doing it and I would uh, definitely recommend uh, people doing it. So the largest uh, hemorrhoid is going to be sclerose first and this is uh, the, your uh, proctoscope inside and you are re-evaluating to see which one I'm going to address first and because each patient may be different and you need to do it again. So this is a normal proctoscope in which you're going to do it. And the proctoscope which requires uh, for is required for sclerotherapy is a proctoscope which has a side cut. In the side cut, you, uh, you inject it. Now, what you can use is a Gabriel needle or you can use a long uh, or you can use a uh, spinal needle. Uh, number 21. So I, I have a Gabriel needle. I use it. You can use it many times. This is uh, creating foam which is quite simple. Two syringes, 5 ml and one three-way, 4 ml of air and 1 ml of uh, liquid. And when you when you really do it, uh, they that's the foam which is created. And once the foam is created, you take it on a Gabriel needle. Why Gabriel needle? It has an angle. And this angle goes up the, above the hemorrhoid. So that's the needle gone in. 
and then I'm pushing the foam. So then you come to Doppler guided hemorrhoidal artery ligation. This has uh, taken USA and Europe by storm. Why? Because they basically don't want to do hemorrhoid surgery. They don't want to do hemorrhoidectomy. They don't want anosinosis. They don't want med uh, litigations. So this uh, really was uh, started. It uses ultrasound to detect the sound of superior hemorrhoidal artery. And once you detect it, you take a stitch below it. This is multiple stitches. It could be anywhere between five to eight stitches at various levels. So with the guide of this, this is the button which is actually detecting the superior hemorrhoidal artery. You take a stitch over it and that's how it works. So it's, it's uh, people who are doing it are doing it in a big way. And what has happened now is DG Hall is good. Uh, we have started doing the same thing with fingers. So you palpate the superior hemorrhoidal artery and take a stitch over there. So DG Hall uh, is gradually tapering off in India because it's costing more. Before with one instrument, you could do 50 cases. Then it came down to 10 cases. Then it came down to five cases. Now it's two cases. So you can only do two. So it costs 10,000. Your cost goes up and then uh, people feel quite restricted. So we, uh, we did multiple studies and we found out that when you do it finger guided and when you do this, the results with finger guided are slightly better. So do we need to do it? If you have it, please do uh, continue doing it. Stapler hemorrhoidopexia, I think everybody in the audience knows what it is and probably have done it. All I want to mention is that when you are doing it, you have to be really careful. And even if you have done a beautiful job, you still may have complications like instrument malfunction. And that is a really terrible nightmare. So for grade 3 hemorrhoids and circumferential hemorrhoids, this is the ideal treatment. You got the stapler inside, you have a nice donut and you see clear cut line. Uh, there's no bleeding from it and that's what you want to achieve. Uh, number of staplers which have been sold, I got this from the horse's mouth, is 330 million staplers worldwide. And actually the figures are more. And uh, this is what you're going to achieve. This is uh, pre-op, on the table and post-op. Again, you see the band of uh, uh, mucosa which is taken out and that's how the patients are relieved. It has its own problems. We're not going into that. Then you have transanal hemorrhoid sutropexy which has taken India by storm. By saying taken India by storm means we have documented more than 12,000 cases which have been done by Indian surgeons. And uniformly, everyone is saying the results are good, including me. I have done over 600 and I, I, I am very happy with it. I just had a problem in one or two cases and uh, no problem at all. So what we are doing is we are pushing this hemorrhoid back to its original place. That is massaging it. The patient is steep, head low, massage everything inside. Everything goes in. And when you insert this proctoscope, it is 40 millimeters uh, diameter. And this Dr. Chiote himself has designed it. It's got a window there. So you take two centimeters and four centimeters above that. That's the window you are going to uh, see. And uh, the suture is circumferential. That means it goes throughout two layers uh, and you double lock it so uh, you don't have a positive effect. The suture you use is Vicryl uh, 2 zero. So this is 2 centimeter and that's 4 centimeter. This is a combination suture. The dots are indicating that they are ligated every time you do it and uh, they really have a great effect. So if you want to see what actually happened, this is before surgery and this is on table. Before surgery and uh, on table and after seven days, it, it really works that way. The beauty is next day when you go to the ward uh, to take your rounds, patients are sitting on bed having coffee or tea and you ask them, how are you? They said, I passed motion. I had no bleeding. I have no pain. That's what a surgeon likes to hear. So it's a good procedure. Then we come to the fourth minimally invasive surgery in hemorrhoid. Uh, sixth uh, is laser. Now laser. People have been doing it. There are various ways of doing it. The one I do is uh, a hybrid procedure in which first I tie the pedicle, that is the superior hemorrhoidal artery, like I would do in DG Hall. And the next procedure is I would put the uh, fiber inside and the conical fiber inside uh, in a 1470 machine and do a hemorrhoidoplasty. So uh, the uh, energy I use is 6 watts uh, in 3 second pulse mode. That means it's only going to run for Three seconds and it will stop no matter how long you press the pedal until you take the foot off the pedal and then repress it, it's not going to do. 
So we have to withdraw 5 millimeters every time we give this pulse. So what are the things we can uh, we are looking for? Here, the supply of superior hemorrhagic arteries, so take a stitch there, you can feel it, palpate it, the volume of the artery becomes threefold whenever you have it. And after taking a pedicle stitch with 200 vicryl, like a figure of eight. So you take one stitch, lift it, and then you take a stitch again. And then before tying it, somebody is going to press on the hemorrhoid to milk it so the uh, blood goes up. So that's the first step you do. It's called finger guided hemorrhoid ligation. And the second step is uh, mass. Uh, this is the mass, and that's where you have to put in the laser and you do a laser hemorrhoidoplasty. And once you put your uh, conical fiber in, uh, you have to first go ahead, that is 6 watts for 1 second and then you go in fan direction so that all the hemorrhoids are covered. You go to the tip and while pulling out you have to keep turning it. Move your uh, wire like this, keep rolling it because it gets stuck. And once you are coming out, just before coming out, don't just yank it out, fire for 1 second then come out and there will be no bleeding. So this is uh, just a short film to show you. That's, uh, Palpation by finger, then taking the stitch and remember pronation, supination should be complete with your hand. Once you take the needle out, then you lift the thread so that uh, you can go under it again. So this is the second bite. Once it goes in again, now this is the time you can uh, milk it and tie it. So the suture is coming out. The thumb of the your assistant is pressing on the hemorrhoid and then you tie it. So after the first knot, they can let go. And then you tie it subsequently and you do this all around. Feel for the hemorrhoidal artery and do it all around. Suppose you felt the hemorrhoidal artery, you have done it and you feel again and you can still feel it, then you can go a uh, little higher up and do it again. And then you keep doing it circumferentially all around. So usually four to six uh, are going to be palpated. And then you take this conical fiber, which is uh, uh, inserted at the mucocutaneous junction and go inside, go up to the pedicle we have ligated and uh, just see if it's too, if it's light is too bright, you're too superficial, it's too dull, you're too deep and then in fan shape, you uh, you do laser ablation or uh, laser hemorrhoidoplasty and this is at the end, nothing is coming out. That's what we want to achieve. Then uh, Chute's hybrid, that means one layer of Dr. Chute's stitch, that is two centimeters, you take it and this one, first one is just Chute's plane and this is Dr. Chute's with laser and this is Dr. Chute's with foam. So you can use anything you want, any form of energy you want to use after you have taken care of the first row. So uh, people have also started uh, doing laser after firing the stapler to take care of the hemorrhoids. So the procedure is the same, you go above the dentate line, two centimeters above and you take a full ring Full ring is like uh, doing a DG hull in various places, but you have taken a circumferential. And after you have taken the circumferential, you go and uh, the, with your laser fiber inside, or you can even do foam. So it, it works well. So foam works well. And you see it. All the three procedures I'm showing you together. For the lack of time, we can't show it individually. But basically, the first row. The first one is uh, extreme left is the one in which the suture is taken at 2 centimeters and 4 centimeters. And after having done the whole thing, let's go towards the end. This is the laser fiber going in. Here you will see the foam being injected. That's, that's the foam and the foam injected after you have taken the stitch. And this one, you are taking the second layer. So, that completes uh, hemorrhoids. Now, coming to fistula, minimally invasive surgery in fistula. Why minimally invasive? Fistula, the gold standard treatment is fistulotomy and fistulectomy. So, minimally invasive surgery, the aim is to preserve the anal sphincter. So, it decreases the anal incontinence. It makes the wounds minimum open wounds and early return to work. And that's why people are preferring it. So the ones which are really focused on are the ones which are uh, in bold. So lift, inner plug, fibrin and stem cells, fixation, laser and waft. These are the ones we are going to discuss. Now what happens when you do a fistula surgery? There is a post-op horror. Whether you realize or not, this was a wonderful surgery done by a wonderful person. And uh, I had witnessed it. 
But post op, look at this. This is just immediately uh, at surgery table, and this is the scene after 10 days. And what we thought was the rectum blew out, but it didn't. The anodental ring was intact. The patient had a little bit of incontinence, but this healed. So don't panic when something is there. Just take out the slit. So these are the things we don't want. And uh, this is my very own patient, which had two large fistula tracts and had taken out. Prolonged healing, anterior fistula in females, you know, we don't want to do it, but you, uh, it does happen. So how does MIS come? This is a 120 kg female who refused to get a open surgery done. She's already had it twice. You can see the scar marks here and uh, she healed. So she healed in three weeks. This is uh, done by WAF. So what we are looking at is doing fistulas like this, multiple fistulas and they heal and they heal very well by doing WAF. So your aim is maximize to minimize. So this is maximum, fistulotomy and fistulectomy. Then lift is a small incision about an inch long and waft and laser are smaller like three or four millimeter size incisions. And that's what we are doing, minimum. So you have a fistula, you can use a combination of waft, lift and laser. All three together can be used. So lift is the most favored. Waft favored in complex tracts and abscesses. Laser hybrid is good in proximal fistulotomy and laser distal. Distal laser, that's the best one. They have five types and good is best is proximal fistulotomy and distal laser. And fixation is really good for uh, tracks which are five centimeters long or less, uh, which are thin, four millimeters, and their anterior straight tracks would fit the bill. Now, inner plug, fibrin, glue, and stem cells. When they first came out, they all claimed results to be upward of 75% cure rate. And with time, we got to know is 50% uh, or less is a cure rate. So they have poor results. Uh, they are quite expensive. So what we have to know is the anatomy of fistula. This is the internal opening. You have the external opening. And this region which I have marked out, this is what you have to do. Why has minimally invasive surgery really come in? Because we realize that only the internal opening and the splinter the portion which is between the splinter, they need to be tackled. Everything else, you can just cure it. In. You can do a laser. You can do a waft. You can do anything. So this is in all cases, no matter what it is, these are the elements you have to take care of. But we keep concentrating on the track. And fistulectomy has been told to be the gold standard. But yes, it's got its own problems. So when you're doing minimal invasive surgery, you have fist waft, so you close the internal opening, and this black is showing the whole tract is curated and external opening is enlarged. In lift, you go in the interspinal tract, you tie it off, you don't do anything to the internal sphincter, external sphincter is open, and you can curate the tract, you can put waft in it, you can put laser in it, whatever you want to do. Plug is putting a plug inside, the tragedy is the many patients come on the first 48 hours with the plug in their hand, which in India costs 40,000 just for the plug. And fibrin glue and stem cells, they really don't work that well. So these two, I would not want you to go into. Now, hybrid procedures are, when you are doing WAF, my basic focus is WAF, then I can do laser with it and I can do lift. That means laser inside the WAF instrument and lift means key to tackle the internal opening. Instead of going to the internal opening, I tackle it in the interspinal space and tie it, ligate it very close to the anus. And lift, you can do lift, you do interspintric uh, ligation of the tract, and you can use laser, fixation, and walk afterwards. So, what is uh, the options you have in lift? So, only lift, lift plus walk, lift plus laser, lift for fixation, bio lift, lift plus trans anal advancement flap, lift plus distal fistulotomy. That's the number uh, you get. So, I'm just showing you, uh, I just want to uh, make you aware what actually happens. When you get the track in the interspinal space, you have total control. And you, what you do with the track depends on you. You want to take the whole thing out, take it out. You want to burn it, burn it. You want to cure it, you cure it. So I'm showing you the dissection. So this is the dissection. That's the track you can see. And see, when I'm doing it, this is the external splinter here. So if I keep dissecting it, I can dissect it all the way till this point. So it's up to you what to do from this point onwards. So I, I generally try to take it out through the external splinter and see the length of the tract I have. Immediately I tie it as close to the internal anal splinter as possible, almost impinging on the anus. And when I do, I transfix it. Otherwise, you know, the moment you cut, the suture comes out. 
So transfixation is the best thing and see the track, amount of track. Now you can decide whether you want to go till here or you want to just dress it a little more till here and then curate that or laser it or do a walk for that. That's entirely up to you. So lift, uh, if you know how to do it, it makes your life easy. It gets easier with a little larger incision. If you take a one centimeter incision, you're gonna have a more tough time. Use xylocaine, uh, uh, saline uh, adrenaline or xylocaine adrenaline there. So you have a bloodless feel. And then you can really identify the track. The track is there easily to see. And uh, if you want to take a tie first, take it, but you have to transfix it. And once you have transfixed uh, both sides, so uh, nowadays what we do is the external splinter side, we leave it. We don't do anything to it because we know where it is. Put, uh, hold it with LS, cut this portion out, and then we decide what to do. And the uh, intervening uh, tract, you can send it for biopsy. Or uh, this is the transfixation. Even though the first one was a ligation, I transfixed the internal opening because that is the one which blows out and the external opening you have to push in saline through it and really see where it is and do it so for this patient then comes uh, the second technique is waft and waft uh, we all know the scope can be put in these places you see the arrows that's all the places and waft can be done with lift so this is lift being done and that's the track you cut the track and then you put the scope in and the distal track you manage with scope. So waft has two phases. Uh, diagnostic stage is the aim is to uh, identify the fistula track and the internal opening and rule out secondary tracks and abscesses. This is what we're doing. And the treatment stage is uh, just disrupt the tap uh, with cautery or laser. And uh, I put in the laser through that uh, waft scope, remove the nictorium material, close the internal opening, excise the uh, uh, margin. Now, just to show you how the results can be, the, the patient had a squatter fistula. It was a very long tract, uh, starting at the base of squatter and going all the way down. So, what we did was we put the scope inside and we put the light. The light comes at the internal opening, so you know this is where it is. Inside the tract, this is you see a straight tract going down, and you will see a lot of uh, the slough inside it. So, you need to take the slough out, clean it out, brush it out. And after that, you cauterize it and again, you need to uh, brush and after brushing it, external opening is enlarged slightly and you keep washing this patient every 2-3 days when the patient comes to you. And you will see within 14-21 to 21 days, the patient has completely healed. So you, don't, you can't even see the scar mark. And this one I showed you, but what exactly was done, how it was done, I'm going to show you. So patient came uh, with multiple unopened he had uh, six fistula openings and this center one was the main one and I put the scope through all of them clean everything out and the center one because it was going super splintering I took the whole thing out did a uh, coring uh, up to the super splintric region where it went in so that whole tract was taken out and you see in that area all these tracks are meeting so this meeting point the whole thing was taken out and after doing that what you need to do is you come back to your uh, specimen wherein you put this uh, fiber. Now I days I put a laser fiber in, or you can put this electrocautery ball tip fiber inside in the internal opening and burn the inside. That means where the infection is going to be. After you have done that, give a good wash and then you take a two zero vital suture to close that opening. So that suture should be like a purse string. It should be deep and two zero vital is to be taken. Don't take superficial stitches. Don't take very thin uh, vicule because they're all going to break away. And after having done this, uh, yeah, this is it. And then we follow the patient up. I just put a tube and this tube was kept for about a week. And that's the start of surgery. And then once we put in methylene blue, you will get actually define the tracks. And then you sort of pour out and clean out. The external opening is enlarged and all of them. A tube is kept and this is the fourth post-op day. Then the 30th post-op day is getting quite well. Only this one was taking time. And uh, when the patient comes after five months, uh, they have a very nice clear. Now fixation is the third one I'm going to talk about, coring of the fistula tract. And uh, the movie itself will tell you what it is. The fistula is there at one o'clock. You take this device. It's called a fixation device for four parts. So the main part is this rod on the right. This is just a probe, so it guides you to the right place. 
the rod goes from the external opening to the internal opening that's how it comes out once it comes out you take this uh, probe out and you put in a base plate what blaze plate does is it gives a big platform so that uh, uh, you don't perforate through now this big platform because it gives that you can now put a cutter this is a cutter so the cutter goes down and it cuts the whole tract and after having cut the tract you you know that um, you have taken the fish log from outside cleaned it out from outside and your cutter has come after the cutter has come naturally take out the base plate because the probe is not going to come out the rod is not going to come out and take the whole assembly out and go directly onto the saline uh, vati and that's your fish log tract and then you've got the whole fish log tract outside you've got the epithelial little tissue and then you close the internal opening after closing it the external opening is in last slide then we have laser fish log surgery now i want you all to be very careful uh, and remember ki please jump don't jump to laser fish log surgery unless you have learned everything about laser and everything about fish log it's the most unrewarding surgery in all of minimally invasive surgery is the laser fish log because everybody thought phylac is you know a magic wand you just put a laser up to the internal opening and take it out burn your way out and then take a stitch at the internal opening a cure no win all of these recur and patients uh, they go to for laser so i have a lot of people who are coming to me after laser that's not how you do it if you really want to do it then proximal lift that means interspintic space take the tract in the interspintic space once you have cut the tract you can do the distal laser or if you could do see the internal opening you do a proximal fistulotomy that means you open from the internal opening to the interspintic space open that muscularize that clean that and the distal tract you laser then it's going to work laser uses a conical fiber which is also known as a corona fiber it has this beautiful 360 degree burn previously it was a 1 mm burn now it's a 4 mm so it gets better and this is where you can uh, take a stitch that is the interspintic space or you can take it just there just below the mucosa some mucosa so our results uh, with uh, dr kamal we had done phylac 42 patients 84 percent success but not really happy with that and then uh, distal laser proximal sloth 93.6 and the fish lot mean one is near 96 percent so why does laser fail because we fail to localize the entire fish lot tract and it's a blind procedure no uniformity of the tract incomplete cleaning because you are not seeing it that's why you should use waf with it and application of energy so you when you're pulling people give pulse mode they still give pulse mode despite the fact we're saying don't give pulse mode give continuous when you give pulse mode you have skip areas so you have to avoid that and failure to close the internal opening or you've closed it it opens up after the first defecation so those are the problem so take home message is minimal invasive surgery in pathology is great but do it with care learn how to do it when not to do it do it correctly do not overdo it and please do follow thank you so much thank you for being a great audience Hello, can you hear me? yeah i can hear you your voice is very faint but i can hear you <laughs> So you have to know all the options, you have to learn all the options, you have to get training, so you have two training centers, one is MAST Mumbai, uh, that is basically IAGS, and the other is Mass Chennai, that is basically Amasi. Okay. So you go to either of these two centers, get basic training, then go to a center who, are, who is doing it. Don't jump to it. Yeah, that is the learning part. But when it comes to pick up one procedure in a given patient, then that becomes a difficult option. How do you pick up a particular option for a given patient? Okay, that is experience. See, if I see, uh, my experience tells me ki if I do uh, uh, lift and waft in this patient, it's going to fail. Maybe because it's anterior, maybe it's because it's too deep. That decision I take on the table. I don't listen to the patient. I tell the patient, my choice is going to be according to your fistula under anesthesia. So under anesthesia, I see how deep the track is. 
how much muscle is going to be uh, cut and if I feel the best option for the patient is fistulotomy, I will do fistulotomy. And okay, they asked for laser, I'll do laser fistulotomy. But I'll do fistulotomy. I will not change the procedure just because the patient told me, you told me endoscopic surgery. No. The patient wants cure. The patient wants no incontinence. So those are the two things I keep my eye on. And decision is usually on the table. And your MRI. So now with your expertise on different procedures, uh, on the have you stopped practicing the uh, conservative way of management of hemodectomy and fistulectomy? No. Hemodectomy, the first step is conservative treatment. And conservative treatment basically involves change in lifestyle, uh, plenty of water, laxatives, and the patient is told to stop straining. These are the things they have to do, whether they undergo surgery or not. They have to do that. If they get well with that, don't do anything else. And you can add flavonoids to it. Flavonoids will decrease the size. If they get well with that, please do not operate. And uh, I am really troubled by people. Uh, I have my students calling me up. Uh, Sir, I fired the stapler and there's no, no, there nothing in the donut, just small, small pieces. Then I asked him, well, what was the grade one? Well, one? So why did you do stapler in grade one? Why were you, I mean, stapler is not indicated for grade one. Just because the patient is bleeding doesn't mean the patient needs surgery. See, we have to know what we are going to treat. So to answer your question, if you want to give good treatment, you should know what you're treating in hemorrhoid. Is it bleeding, prolapse or thrombosis? All three have different treatment. In fistula, you should know where your fistula tract lies. Is it deep? And if it's deep, please take care of the center. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Koshal. So, let me come up to another session. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mithal, for elaborating and accepting our invitation. And I think uh...